people helped Paul when he was in another place. And Paul was writing back now to thank him. And this is what he said. I, he said, I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned, underline learned. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. Underline no. Then he said, I have what? Learned. Underline learned. The secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all through all this through him who strengthens me. Paul learned. You know, when, you, when you're in school and you're learning some stuff, you don't learn it all in one day. When you graduate from high school, you know, we, I know we got a bunch of college graduates here, but, uh, but I, I didn't make it that far. My highest grade was, was high school, and, and I've, I've learned the, the significance of, of, of feeling good when I finish that. But it wasn't over. I still had learning to do. It's not all the time easy when you're learning something. Sometimes you have to go through some things in order to learn. Look here. Do you think Paul was happy and feeling good when he didn't have nothing? See, I've, 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 I've been both full and hungry. That's from one end to the next. But even while he was full, he learned something. When he was hungry, he learned something. He went through the experience of knowing. Now, now, he's reaching a plateau in his life. He say, he say, I know what it is to be in need and to have plenty. Then he said, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. And 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 God don't God don't mix words. When he says any situation, Paul has been through some stuff because he was writing about himself. God, Jesus went through some stuff. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. If they went through some stuff, trust me, sisters and brothers, we got to go through some stuff in order to get to everything lovely. See, that's another little something we got going on back there. We're trying, to, we're trying to get to, to where my brother is, the everything lovely part. But we're growing to it. You don't get there. Some of the stuff I used to complain about yesterday, I don't complain about today. I know my leg go hurt. It's part of the stroke. But I could have been dead. It's a reality. I'm still here. So I forget this thing and I keep on pressing. It's going to hurt if I'm at home. It's going to hurt if I'm in the chair. It's going to hurt when I move. When I, so I just decided I'm going to let it hurt and keep moving. But when I first started on it, I had to, I had to will them. I just had an experience to get to the understanding. This thing going to hurt anyway. I lay down for a while and prop it up and it hurt. I lay in my chair, put some warm on it, it hurt. This old arm be cold all the time. It hurts. But I had to go through it because when it first started, I had wisdom. The doctor told me, you know, you give me some knowledge that some of this stuff in my head wasn't going to never come back. My feelings may not come back like this. So I had to, I had the knowledge. And after a while, the, I worked that night and I had wisdom. Oh, yeah, I'm going to hurt. But when I got to understand it, it's going to hurt anyhow. So it don't worry me. I've learned to be content with it. Not in any and every situation, but with this one, I done learned to be content. Why? Because I got to understand it ain't going to get no better. So I'm going to keep moving. 
The highlight of this here whole thing, what Paul was talking about, is this last verse, 13. 13 verse. Read it to yourself. Uh, it took some time to get there. He had to experience some stuff in order to get there. The man was shipwrecked. He was bitten by snakes. He was thrown down the side. He, 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 he was oppressed on every side. He was bothered by this and bothered by that. He had folks there working with him that he had to send home. You remember Mark? Mark wasn't ready. He told Mark, get, get him away from me. But when he got older, he said, go, go get Mark. He's usable now. So he learned that if he just endure, God will fight some battles. Have you learned that? Have you learned that if you just hold your peace? Huh? God will fight your battle. But you don't know that when you're in the, when you, when you're in the war. You got the information on it. How many of us have fought stuff that we, we just sat down and shut up, everything be all right? You remember me last couple last week I was telling you I was going through, through I was under attack? Well, I, done, I tried fighting. Give them away. Then it hit me and said, how long are you going to do this? So I said, well, I made up my mind. I'll go stand still. It ain't over yet, but a whole, it's a whole lot better. God done work some stuff out of it. Mm, I wasn't expecting that. But then I do expect it because of what he said. Stand still. Don't, 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 don't lean to your understanding, Gilmore. Stand still. Look at that 13. Paul said, I can do all things. Huh? Through Christ who strengthens me. He had went through some stuff to get to all. Now, could you imagine? He going to make a statement like that? I can do all things through Christ. Who, he had just said, I done had much and I had a little. I've been full and I've been hungry. He done been in some situations. But now he know when I'm hungry, he going to feed me. When I'm broke, he going to give me something, some money in my pocket. Uh, uh, when when I, I, I learned to stand still and let him fight my battle. Paul was a warrior. Paul wasn't no, he was a warrior. He knew how to fight. But he went through some stuff in order to get to 13. I can do all things. He had understanding about it. It wasn't me fighting, it was me standing still. It, 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 wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't me that, that, that put it on your heart to send me some money. God did it. He knew I was broke. He knew I needed some money. So he sent me some. And I just thank you for being the carrier of it. That's what he told the Philippians. He said, but, but I'm here to tell you, I don't need it. I don't need your money. And I'm not in a, in a, in a time of need. Because I've been both full and home, with and without. But I learned, whichever situation I'm in, whichever is a very important word, because it's something you're going through that God can do. It's something that you're going through that God can do. It's something that you're going through, and we all ain't going through the same thing. But all things, huh? all means all. That's one of the simple words you can look up in your, in your concordance. They all mean the same thing. All means, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Paul went through a lot before he got to that, that last verse. He had some knowledge. He had that. Paul had more knowledge. God revealed to him a whole lot of stuff in the beginning. But now Paul at the end of his ages. He at the end of his, he had, he had run a long race. Before he made this statement, he had went through some stuff. His knowledge had, had worked, and now he has wisdom concerned. The wisdom had time to work through experiencing, through time. And the old man finally said, I know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Lord, we, 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 well, I just want to thank y'all, man. I, I'm so glad that this part of, of what he's been showing me really... And that's my, that's my phone. Let me know everything going on. 
uh, knowing that a, a God can. God can do all things through Christ. Who, who, you know, and, and, and all we got to do is rely on him. Just allow him an opportunity. Like I told y'all last week, ever since I said I was going to stand still, well, things have got better. I just shut up. Started looking around and watching stuff. And man, this, this just started happening. That started happening. And I, the battle ain't over. But I ain't saying nothing. I'm sitting there watching. Because I'm going to have a testimony after this thing. I'll be able to help somebody else. Thank y'all. Come on, Pastor. Well, all right, let's make our hands happy tonight. Bless God. Gracious Father, we love you tonight. Thank you again and again for your great grace today. Thank you for brand new mercy. And truly, Father God, your loving kindness is better than life. Thank you, Father God, that you loved us with a gift that was moved on your heart that you was willing to give your son. Gracious Father, we thank you so much tonight for what you have already done for us and for all that you're yet doing. Father God, we know that we'll never be able to thank you enough, nor will we be able to pay you back for all that you have already done, all that you've already given. But we do come tonight, my Father, to express our gratitude again unto you for who you are tonight. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your favor. We thank you for your patience, your long-suffering with us, for all that you do every single day that we can live and have life. My Father, we bless you for that tonight. Let us pray, my Father, tonight on behalf of others that do seek thy face, of every single person, Father, that feel the need of thee. Have mercy upon us all. Strengthen us where we're weak. Build us up where we're torn down. Continue, Father God, to lead us and to guide us in the way that you would have us to go. And then, my Father, I pray that you would give us an humble and a submissive heart and spirit that we would yield our way to you, Father, that you can direct our path, that you can lead us in a straight way and in a good way, that we can bring glory and honor to your name. Thank you, my Father, for all that have gathered tonight to hear your word, to be instructed out of your word tonight. Thank you for those that have prayed, those that have come tonight, my Father, with an open heart and an open mind to receive your word. Thank you, my Father, for Reverend Stanley and other teachers that come and they began to get us ready, get us hungry, my Father, provoke and stimulate our appetite that we will have a hunger and we'll have a desire for you. Now, my Father, we sit at your table to be fed from you. Feed us, my Father, that we can live, that we can learn, and that we can be to the praise of your glory. Thank you tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. My hand goes up tonight as my indication again that this has been a blessed day in God, amen. I mean to know every day is a good day. Every day is a good day because every day is a gift from God. And everything that truly mattered, we can safely say that it did start on this day. All right, good to see you every Tuesday. Thank you so much for your commitment and your push uh, to come to Bible study. I've been on the other side of this thing where I had to work and get off from work and feed myself and deal with my children and then try to press my way to Bible study. And you're talking about a full docket. That's a full docket. And I recognize that you guys are actually putting up a great sacrifice. And it's not easy to do that. And I am deeply moved and appreciative every Tuesday when I see you come uh, to hear God's word. I do not take it lightly. And I just want to let you know that my heart overflows with much thanksgiving to each of you uh, for what you do when you come. Now, me and God could come, but I can tell you, meeting with God, you and us together, is a whole lot better. Amen. So let's get busy tonight again. Uh, we're going to conclude tonight this little subject matter that we started talking about entitled Learning from Others' Example. Amen. Uh, Prayerfully, you have been blessed like I have been blessed as we've talked about it. Looking back in my own life, I can see how that my life have been lifted to a higher level simply by learning from other people's example. Uh, many people uh, that have left their footprints on the pages of the Holy Bible have their name enshrined in the Holy Scripture. Really, they were people just like you and I 
who actually did a lot of that learning, got a lot of their knowledge from God, the do's and don'ts about walking with God from actually observing other people's example. You can get a great blessing by watching how God has shown himself strong through the lives of other people. You can actually position yourself where you can actually start off where others stop. You can actually reach higher because you are privileged now to stand on somebody else's shoulder. You don't have to go back and reinvent the wheel. You can actually jumpstart your spiritual growth. You can actually bypass a lot of pitfalls on the journey of growing up in Christ and all that kind of stuff. If you would just be observant, if you would just uh, have a listening ear, an observant heart to watch those that you believe God has so marked with the Holy Spirit, how that he's navigating them, growing them, and if you would just have a keen eye of observation, you don't have to go through a lot of the stuff that they went through in order to become full grown and to live to the praise of God's glory. So prayerfully, these lessons that we have talked about has actually keen your sense of spirituality, giving you a better perspective of who to watch, how to actually look at others and the examples that they are setting. And then as you do that, God is also growing you that you can become an example for somebody else. As I have told us in lessons prior to tonight, that everybody, believe it or not, you are an example to somebody, all right? So let's do our best going forward that we actually make good steps, that we leave good examples for those that are coming behind us that they can follow in the same good example. Amen? All right, so tonight we're going to enjoy Bible study again. What I want to do tonight is to walk through the Holy Scripture and let you see uh, Bible characters and people, real-life Bible personalities who have actually learned from other people's example, and they have actually become great men and women of faith. They actually have their names enshrined in the Holy Scripture. You cannot open your Bible without actually seeing the footprints of these people that we're going to talk about tonight. And the reason that they are there is not because of so much what they did as much as the fact that they, uh, they were in position to catch what others were dropping. They were gleamers. Uh, they were seekers. They were good followers of those that they believed were actually walking in the pathway of God. And as a result of them having a good attitude, uh, not being arrogant and proudful, they now humble themselves and they began now to catch what was falling from the lives of other people, put that in their own life, surpass many of their mentors, and they now have their names enshrined in the scripture. Many of them have already made the honor roll of faith. These were ordinary people just like you and me, but they learned, they didn't learn it all through the school of hard knocks that they went through because of some type of disobedience or whatever they went through. They learn a lot by simply watching other people example, and this is how they made their own lives better, okay? So tonight, we're going to uh, look at some of these people that have actually made an indelible markup on the scripture because they learn from other people's example. Uh, we're just going to just take a little journey through the scripture, then we'll come back and we'll put a good wrap on it tonight. Joshua, he actually learned from Moses' example. That's right. Joshua was Moses' uh, mentee, okay, and he was also Moses' successor. Go to the book of Joshua, chapter number one. That's where we're going to jump off tonight. Joshua actually learned a lot about leading God's people, uh, not when he became leader. Yes, he learned more going forward, but he had already learned a lot about the do's and don'ts of leadership by actually following the example of Moses. So Joshua learned a lot from Moses' example. Okay, look at Joshua chapter number one, and we'll just talk a little bit from that uh, going forward tonight. Joshua chapter number one. He is now, Moses is now dead, and uh, Joshua has now uh, assumed the reins of spiritual leadership over the people of God. Let me begin reading uh, with verse number 
1. It said, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, a Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all the people, unto the land which I give to them, even to the children of Israel. Look at verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon have I given unto you. As I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, even until the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your border. There shall not be any man that is able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail you, nor will I forsake you. This is God's word to Joshua. He said, Joshua, you saw how I was with Moses. You saw my example with Moses. You were there. See, when Joshua hears this, it is more than just words to Joshua. It is now, it is now a reflection because Joshua was right there with Moses when Moses was going through all of this transition and all of this turmoil, trying to lead God's people into the land that he had promised to give to them. He saw the highs and lows of the spiritual leadership of Moses. So when God tells Joshua these words, they are more than just words. They are actually in their examples to him. He said, wait a minute. You are telling me that you're going to be with me like you was with Moses? You're not catching it tonight. Because Joshua was there when God used Moses to bring those plagues up on the nation of Israel. He said, he said you're, going to, you're going to show yourself mighty with me just like you did with, with Moses? Joshua was there when they came to the Red Sea and they had no way to get across. And God told Moses, get up off your knees and cease praying. Stretch out your rod and believe me. And the waters of that mighty sea rolled back. They congealed on both sides. And the children of Israel walked across on dry land. And then when Pharaoh's army tried to pursue them, what worked for God's people won't work for every people. The waters that parted from them came back and they drowned the whole army of the nation of Israel. You're not catching it tonight. Joshua was right there and he saw that. And then he saw when they came out of that situation and they got out there and they needed food, God made the quail fly in. Quail came in and stacked up and the children of Israel ate quail so much until they had them running out of their nostrils. And when they needed water, God told Moses, just speak to the rock and give them water. When they needed manna, God rained down manna. When their enemies came against them, God fought for them and they became victorious. When they came up against the mighty impregnable city of Jericho and God told them, y'all ain't got to fight because the battle is mine. All I want you to do is just march around six times, one day, six days, and on the seventh day, one time or whatever, and just shout and I got it all done. He was right there and he saw all of that. He said, wait a minute, you telling me? You're going to be with me just like that? So now, what Joshua is able to do, he's now able to learn that I can now be still and I can now trust God. I don't have to fret and I don't have to worry. Same God that was with Moses is the same God that was with me. You do know he said, I'm no respect of person. What I've done for one, I'll do for another. Find a believer, a real believer, that God has already proven himself to be strong in that person's life. You have seen the plight, you have seen the walk, and you know that there's no way that they could have walked through what they've been walking through except God was leading them by the hand, and you followed that person's example, and the same God that walked with them, talked with them, delivered them, is the same God that will grab your hand and bring you up, out, and over because that's what God can do, and that's what God God will do. So you don't have to go back and try and reinvent the wheel, become a super spiritual star, a spiritual superstar. You don't have to do that. Just learn how to be humble. Learn how to follow others' example. Let the same God that led them lead you, and God will do that. 
What our problem is, we operate in too much pride. We want to have something to boast about. And I can tell you, following God, you will have nothing to boast about other than what he's done. Other than what the cross has already made available for us, that's the only thing that we will ever have to boast about. So Joshua actually learned a lot about leading God's people from watching Moses' example. All right? Elisha, write down Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Joshua learning from Moses' example. Elisha learned from Elijah. Example. Write down 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. Elisha, that great prophet, learned a lot from his mentors, Elijah's example. He learned from him by observing the life of his father in the ministry. He learned a lot. He watched him uh, when he went up against the prophets of Baal. He saw all of that. He watched him when God used him to, to bring judgment upon the nation of Israel how that God held up his word, how that it didn't rain uh, in the land of, of Canaan for three plus years because Elijah's words had so much power and God honored it until he shut up heaven. Uh, he saw how God fed Elijah by the brook, how he used a raven to do that. He saw all of that and he walked with him close and he wanted, he wanted to emulate uh, his mentor because Elijah told Elisha, look, uh, uh, son, uh, I'm not going to be around him much longer. And if you want what I got, you better follow me close because I feel the father's getting ready to take me up. And he asked him, what do you want? He says, I want a double portion of what you have. You're not catching my teaching tonight. He never would have desired a double portion if Elijah had not modeled something before him. If he had not set an example of godliness, he never would have declared that I want a double portion of what you have. And he says, I tell you what, if you want to get the double portion, what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to follow my example. He said, you got to hang with me. You got to go where I go and you got to come when I come. These were the instructions. And at one time, he tried to tell Elijah, why don't you just stop from following me? And Elijah told him, so wait a minute, I can't stop following you because you are my example. And I really want to get, I, I want off of your life what God has put on it. I recognize that God has put his anointing on your life. I recognize that God has put his power on your life. I've seen how God moved through you, man of God, and I want that for myself. I want to follow that example. So he says, if you follow me, not only that, but if you see me when the Father take me up, you can get what I got. Do I have any Bible readers tonight? And Elijah, and Elijah was walking one day, and God sent down the chariot. And old man Elijah stepped in. And Elijah said, at last, at last, my father, I see thee when I go. And the scripture said that old man Elijah dropped the mantle back down to Elisha. And Elijah walked back and did the first miracle when he used the mantle of Elijah to part the waters of the Jordan River. And everybody knew that Elisha had actually got the double portion from Elijah. He did that now because he followed his example. Let me ask you a question. What are you really trying to catch from the lives of others? You know, we are so busy trying to emulate, really being jealous of others, okay, until we're not trying to catch the right thing from the lives of others. I never shall forget, uh, I regret it to this day, that when the late Reverend uh, Cecil Davis was actually passing away, uh, he sent word to his sister that was a good friend of my mother-in-law that tell Randy to get to my bedside quick. 
And uh, when I got there, he was still alive, but he was not uh, in a position where he could actually do any uh, recognizable uh, communication with me. And uh, I thought about it. I said, maybe I missed out on something that he was trying to drop. You're not catching it. Because he had an anointing on his life. You're not walking with me. And we followed these people because of the anointing that they carry. And this is really what we desire to catch from the lie when God take them away from here. The anointing uh, doesn't have to become dormant, okay? The anointing can actually become transferable if you have somebody that is following in the example and they want to catch that anointing off of their lives. If you follow somebody close enough, you will mimic their lives. Here's what I discovered. If you, if you have a certain gait, a certain walk, and your child see you long enough, they're going to have that certain gait, and they're going to have that certain walk. Are you catching me? They are actually watching your example. So it is with those that we deem spiritual mentor. If we watch that walk, watch that lie, we can catch that gate and we can catch that example so that when we begin to grow up in Christ and we begin to move forward in the things of God that we have learned from their example and we don't have to sweat a whole lot of stuff, we can walk through it by simply reflecting back because past experience can give me present comfort in that if the same God that brought them through it, he will bring me through the same thing also. So we're still learning from others' examples. So Elijah learned from Elijah's example, 2 Kings 2, 9. Now, I wish I really had time to do this justice tonight because I had so much fun uh, doing this today. Ruth learned from Naomi's example. Now, this one took, the, took my breath away. Look at Ruth chapter number 1 verses 16 through number 18. Ruth learned from Naomi's example. Okay, go ahead and look there in your Bible. Ruth chapter 1, verse number 16 through verse number 18. Ruth was a Moabite girl, young lady. She had married Naomi's son, whom had uh, now uh, died and Naomi and Ruth actually comes back from the land of Moab, back to the land of Bethlehem, because it had been known abroad that God was visiting his people again. And the notation of this visitation was the fact that God was now giving his people bread. So Naomi, this uh, Ruth rather, this Moabite young lady, comes back with Naomi, totally ignorant, does not know anything about the culture, does not know anything about the custom of the nation of Israel, and she needed her mother-in-law to coach her to become an example for her that she might be able to make a life for herself, and not only that, but she can actually be used uh, by God that she can become the, the woman that is actually going to bring back uh, the restoration of Naomi and her whole family. Uh, Ruth was the one to do that, and she followed Naomi's example. She was gleaming in the field. She's a young lady. She's been married right now. This is her daughter-in-law, and there's this kinsman redeemer by the name of Boaz. Okay, he's a wealthy man. He is, he is in line that he can actually redeem them because they have fallen on hard times and God has already devised a system in his word or in the family of God that if any of the families fell on hard time that they could actually now be brought back to where they could have some type of existence and prominence uh, that name of that family would not be plucked out of the land or out of the nation at that time. So Boaz, he is in line as a kinsman redeemer, but he's not the closest one, okay? And Ruth now is working for him, okay? And she don't know what to do. She doesn't know what to do. She's young, and she needed an example. She needed somebody experienced, you're not tracking with me, to help her to avoid a whole lot of embarrassment, a whole lot of pitfalls or circumstances that might befall her. 
And Naomi was her example. She, met, she was gleaming in the field of this rich man that's a kinsman redeemer by the name of Boaz. And she wanted to let him know that it was okay for him to proceed with the redemption procedures according to what was written in the law. But, she, but, but, but Ruth didn't know how to carry this out. But Naomi did because Naomi was her example. Yes. She said, come in, young lady, let me tell you what to do. I want you to go in and wash yourself. Yes. Not only that, but I want you to smell good, and I want you to dress up. And tonight, the men are going to be down at the threshing floor. They're going to be threshing wheat. And when you go down there tonight, I want you to go down there, and I don't want you to sleep with the man. Uh -huh. I want you to sleep at his feet. Yes. I want you to sleep at his feet and stay there until he recognizes you because here's what, see, see when, when Boaz saw that Ruth was at his feet, he was fully aware that she was there so that he would now know that it was okay for him to move forward to become the kinsman redeemer. That was the custom of the land. The way you got a man, you didn't sleep with a man, you slept at his feet. And she told her how to go about doing that. She mentored this young lady in the right way. She was a good example. And Boaz woke up in the middle of the night, saw her sitting there, and she told him what he needed to know about being the kinsman redeemer. To make a long story short, Boaz ended up marrying Ruth. And from Ruth, we get Obed. And from Obed, we get Jesse. And from Jesse, we get David. And from David, we get Jesse. Jesus the prime example that's what we get but you have to follow the fact you have to know that she had an example that helped her to avoid a whole lot of pitfalls along the way notice if you will she started off in the field first thing she was gleaming in the field the next time you see her she's at his feet and the next time you see her she's Miss Boaz She's up in the family, if I can say it like that. She did that because she had, she had an example. She learned from Naomi's example. Older women ought to teach younger women. That's Bible. We learn that way, and this is what God wants us to do. Okay, uh, write this down. The church learned from Israel's example. We've already talked about that one. The church learns from Israel's example. We can go 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 and verse 11. The church learned from Israel's example. The believer should learn from Christ's example. Come with me in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 verse 21 just cross over with me 1 Peter if you don't know how to find Peter use your table of contents 1 Peter 1 Peter 2 21 get there tonight It says, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Christ becomes the believer's example. As he had to suffer and live in obedience to his father, he says we ought to follow that same example. So Christ becomes the believer's example. Timothy learned from Paul's example. We talked about that last week. Now, come with me tonight in Philippians chapter number three. Just go back with your left hand. Uh, Philippians chapter three, verses 17 through 19. I think that's it. I hope so.
Give me a sec to find that passage. Yeah. Are you ready? He says, brethren, be followers together of me. He said, look, look, talking to the church. Look, I want you guys to follow my example. Be followers of me and mark them who walk even as ye have us for an example. This is what he's saying. Look, I want you to follow my example. Not only my example, but I want you to mark those who are actually walking the same way we're walking and use them as an example. This is what he's saying. He says, I'm an example, and there are others who are following my lifestyle. They are examples also, and I want you all talking to the church. I want you all to follow their example. All right? Let's see if we can go a little bit further with that one. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. He says, wait a minute, everybody is not a good example. I've already warned you. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal, saying he is actually not talking about everybody that's outside of the church building. He said there are some in the fellowship of believers that are not walking as believers. Can I help you tonight? And it is not offensive. It is reality. Every believer does not be behave as a believer. We have, to, we have to have our behavior in check so that we can now grow forward behaving like believers should behave. So he said, there are some who are in the family, I told you before, and I tell you now weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now that's something to think about. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. They don't even know it because they are not walking like believers should walk. They're enemies. They're actually causing others to walk astray rather than walk right because they are uh, actually influencing the lives of others to walk like they're walking. They are not helping the body. They are hurting the body. And I was studying these scriptures today, and it made me think about, man, what's my walk like? Am I walking in such a way until I'm actually leading people away from Christ? Am I really an enemy to the cross of Christ? Do I walk one way while I'm at church and a totally different way when I leave the building and, and go someplace where I think maybe I'm not under the watchful eye of a church member or somebody that know my life? What, 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 is the, what is the real me like when nobody's watching me? What kind of example am I setting on a consistent basis with my life? Everybody look like they're walking right on Sunday. All of y'all look like you're walking right tonight, as far as I can tell, but that might not be the case. There are others that know me up close and personal, even behind closed doors, so they know the real deal about who I really am, okay? And that's the real walk of me. And he said, there are many that are walking contrary to that. I've told you about them, and I now tell you weeping that those, those that walk this way, that they are really enemies of the cross. Now, that's something to think about. Okay? Is how, I, is how I'm living my life really hindering people from coming to God? Think about that. Think about it. I wonder what type of drawing influence does my life have? I wonder how many people have I really driven away from wanting to come to God because they saw a double standard in my life. And literally I was really not an ally. I actually became an enemy to the cross. He said, wait a minute. He said, follow my example and the example of those that have actually bought into the example that I said. Follow that example. Talk, talking to these Philippians, that's the example that I want, want you to follow. He said, I tell you, weeping, that they are enemies of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God, here it is right here, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. He says, uh, they really wasn't in it to give glory to God. 
they was in it for themselves, whose appetite is themselves. They wasn't in it because they were being led to do it. It was something that they were trying to get out of it for self-gratification or maybe self-promotion. It was to enhance their status, their influence, maybe make them look bigger, better in the eyes of their peers. But from the heart perspective, they were never doing it from the heart. They were never doing it to set an example of how believers should walk before God. They had an ulterior motive. They really wasn't doing it because they were sold out to serve God, that, that life could be a beacon light to help somebody to walk better, to know what God is like. And in the end, they could see the salvation that God has both temporal and eternal. That was not the intent or the aim behind they was doing it. They were doing it because they were doing it for their own appetite. Man, that's something to think about. Something to think about. What more? What mo I ask myself the question, why do I do what I do? I really do. I ask myself that. Why do you come to Bible study? You think about that? Why do, you, why do you make the sacrifices you make? Why do you come to church? Think about it. Is it so that you can be made feel better about what you're doing? I ask myself these probing questions every day. Am I really doing it because I believe that this is the purpose that God has for my life? Am I doing it because I want to live to set an example for others? Uh, I close with this tonight. When my children were born, I realized then that I really needed to do everything I could out of my own power and own strength and always soliciting help from God that I could live my best life before them because I knew that they were watching me. And I was obligated to do my best to set a good example before them about how a father or how a, a man of God should actually live his life so that others would want to follow. I told my children, I say, um, I was joking with them, I said, you all cannot smoke weed because I smoke your portion. You cannot drink because I've drunk your portion. You cannot do this because I did it all so that there's nothing left for you to do. I want to set a good example before you. I told them if you guys learn how to curse, you will not learn from me or your mom because we are going to do our best to set a good example before you that when we begin to try to discipline you, you cannot say, I learned it from you, Dad. I learned it from you, Mom. They cannot throw that back in our faith because we determined that when they was born that we was going to do our best to set the right example before them that they would know how to follow after godliness. They promote me to do that because I realized I was obligated to set that type of an example before them because they are going to have to set an example going forward, okay? And if you want to leave a spiritual legacy for your family, you're not hearing me. If you want to leave a spiritual legacy for your family, walk up right before your children. Me and her talk about it. I know you say, Pastor Williams, all you do is brag on your children. You bet your bottom dollar. I brag on them because I put a whole lot of hard work in them. I'm serious. Uh, you don't become a good parent by accident. You, 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 you got to work at this thing. You got to make sacrifices at doing it. So we get up and we, we just say, we, don't, we talk. We say, we don't have to worry about them children going to church. Don't worry about them going to church. We follow Proverbs 22, 6. Train them up. When he's young, in the way that he should go. And when he's old, what the boy? we don't have to worry about him going to church. We don't have to worry about them children tithing, giving money to God. We, we, oh, I never see y'all tithe. Y'all pay your own oh, oh, That's a waste of breath. I do that. Because that's, 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 all they, that's all they've seen. 
We told them we have food in our house because we give to God. And God is our source. Everything else is a resource. Don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about them praying. Don't have to worry about that. We set an example. Every night. Every night when they were small, we prayed every night at the foot of the bed. Y'all know my story? I was a prayer hog. I prayed four nights. I gave each one of them one. And the girl was what, Mama, why daddy get a chance to pray so much? Not only do he pray so much, he prayed too long. But we learn how it, it, they had prayer night. Nope, nope. You got this your night to pray. It's your night to pray. And then they sit down there. They say their prayers. Say their prayers. And then when they got to be teenagers, they told me one night, they said, Daddy, we don't need it like that no more. We got it now. <laughs> <laughs> said, Daddy, you can trust us now. We got it. We got it, Daddy. We got it. And then I hear them praying. I see them praying. I see them reading the Bible. They call me with question. Daddy, you see this? Daddy, you know this? Okay. It starts by laying the track of a good example. And that's what God wants us to do. Lay a good example. Follow others' example that we know that are walking right before God that can help us to become better at our walk with God. And if we do that, that can, that can be a living legacy that we can leave for our children that I left a good example with my life as to how we ought to follow after our God. And you're in heaven looking down and your children and family, they are being blessed in this wicked world in which they are going to have to live. Yeah. The older you get, and you realize your own sense of mortality. You, you really don't care a lot about gold watches and uh, trophies and stuff like that you got from working 40 and 50 years on a job. You don't care about that kind of stuff because it has no lasting value. When you get older and you're on your deathbed, I've never seen nobody say, bring me my trophy. Bring me my gold watch for 50 years of service. When you're on your deathbed, what you want to see, you want to be able to look up and you want to be able to see your greatest asset. And that's your children, your family that you have sown your life into and you now can go to sleep in God. You're not hearing me. You can go to sleep in God knowing that they're going to be all right. You're not catching it. You can, you can die then. You can go to sleep then. Because you know they got it. You know they are in him. You know that they followed your example. It's in them. And you don't have to worry about it. I've seen parents, I'm talking about, should have already been dead and gone. But they couldn't die. What was keeping them here was the fact that they was worried about their families. Just holding on. I, I, I heard it said, uh, was a person that was dying and they had a son that was rebellious and never came home. And this woman held out. She put death on hold until her son came home. And she talked to him on her deathbed. God gave her that. And this, 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 is, this is the real assets of life. This is the value of life. This is, this is how you script it. Leaving that example. And then when you've done that, when you know your seed is all right, they know the same God you know. God going to take care of them. What you can do now, you can lay down and you can breathe your life out because you know you have walked it out before them. You have set the example and they have caught it and all is going to be well with them when you are gone. So I challenge you tonight as I challenge myself in closing. I got to continue to be an example. And I thank God for all the examples of godly men and women that God has put before me to emulate in my walk. They have helped me immensely along the way. And I'm indebted to them to live a better life. You're not listening. I'm indebted to them to reach higher because I started off standing on their shoulders. 
Let me quit in one minute. Uh, God put a restlessness in my spirit many years ago when we was up on fidelity. It got so bad until I told my wife, um, uh, we don't get off the corner, I'm going to leave the church. I'm not going to die there. I'm not going to die there. She said, what's wrong? I said, there's no way in the world that I want to face Deacon M.E. Jackson, Deacon Herbert, and all those other deacons that actually sold into that church, left us debt free, left us where we were, and all we did, we didn't even maintain. We didn't even go no further, and I gotta, I gotta go to heaven, and I gotta stand before them, and they're gonna say, Randy, what y'all, what y'all do? We left y'all dead free. What else did y'all do? How many other souls did y'all win? Did y'all build another building? Did y'all help anybody, or did y'all just maintain? Let me tell you something. God don't want you maintaining. God wants you gaining. I told my wife, I said, I gotta get off of here. Ain't no way in the world I'm going to die on fidelity. No way in the world. Either I'm leaving the, I'm leaving the church or something got to give. Because I refused to stand before those men. Because I saw when we was on fidelity how Mr. Gurry Mitchell, Deacon Jackson, Reverend McGee, man, we was back there trying to pay for that building and everything. They were making sacrifices. Oh, God, I wish I had time to talk to you tonight. Watch Reverend McGee pay his tithe. I said, man, that son gonna make a whole lot of money. Deacon Jackson, $87.06. That's what they did. Sacrificing for the church. Rep came up with a way. He said, we gonna, we, gonna, we, gonna, we gonna pay this church off in eight years. That's what he said. We gonna buy money market, the back that time CDs was yielding a whole lot of money. We went to the bank, we bought some CDs with the little money they had, and that money started growing. I'm talking about God was blessing it. That money blew up in about eight years. Eight years we paid that thing off. Paid it off. And all we was gonna do was just sit up there and, and do nothing? No, no. I started off on that shoulder. Amen. Let me quit. I promise you, when these words come out of my mouth, I'm done. To whom much is given. <laughs> come, Brother Gregory. No, don't tell it, Greg. Don't tell it. <laughs> But mama had brought up Greg in the way that he should go. You had a foundation. You strayed away, but it didn't let you go. The Bible is true. Mama laid the foundation, but mama set an example. An example. Hear me tonight. When we come to check our time of this life, that's what you're going to look for. That's what you're going to pride. When you see them kids, the grandkids, okay, and you invested your life in them, and they are in God, and you got peace about it, you can close your eyes and travel to the other side. So let's do our best to live this life so that others will want to follow. Let's do that. That's our challenge. God bless you. It has been my pleasure to talk to you tonight. It really has. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do offering tonight. I do solicit your prayers because we need help from each other. Okay. Uh, and when we are not walking right, let us not judge and condemn one another. I, did, I stopped. Paul said that in this verse I was reading last. He says, some walking that way, turn them out. But even when you turn them out because they're walking wrong, treat them right because they're still a brother. they just a brother that ain't walking right. So let's do that. Okay. All right.
Get your offering together and we will, we will ask God to bless it tonight. Amen. Gracious God, our Father, we love you much always. Thank you for your grace tonight. Thank you for your precious word. Thank you for your believers, your people, my Father that are here tonight to learn of you. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit help to teach us. Now, Father God, we give this offering tonight with gladness, knowing that you are our source. Everything else is a resource, but everything good comes from you. Bless it as we give. Keep it now. Keep us now. Restore it back unto us that we can give more in the future. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.